Welcome to the Deeper Dive Podcast, brought to you by the OC Church of Christ. The Deeper Dive Podcast is about going deeper into God's word, learning new insight, and taking a fresh look at the verses that impact our daily lives. Today, we have a special privilege and honor of having Gordon Ferguson with us. We are going to do a Q&A. As you know, we just completed a four-part series, Revelation Revealed, the same title as Gordon's book, Gordon is an international speaker and teacher, author of many books, and a former elder and evangelist. Gordon, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you already for all the material and content you have provided. We're so grateful to have you on the program. Well, thank you, Marcel. It's good to be with you. It's interesting, uh, even though I've been teaching Revelation for a lot of years, I haven't been asked to do it for a while. And now all of a sudden I'm getting more invitations. I just got a, an email from an old friend in Europe saying that they're going to have that for their subject in June in the European Bible School. And so I guess I'll be teaching it via Zoom uh, on that program uh, early summer. So anyway, it's good to get back into Revelation. I have taught it for a number of years and always happy to share uh, the things that I know about it which I think is a fair amount, but uh, anyway, good to be with you. Thank you again. Well, let's go ahead and get right into it. I think one of the obvious questions that many of us have is why even use apocalyptic, apocalyptic language? Well, that's a good question. Uh, really, that is a question for God, <laughs> since he's the one who did it, right? Uh, we have pointed out in the series itself uh, in two lessons, actually, in the Old Testament, that God did that quite a bit in the Old Testament, and then in the intertestamental period, a lot more. A lot of books in the intertestamental period, but it was just a way of communicating. Uh, the Bible uses many different genres of writing. We've got poetry, we've got prophecy, we've got straight prose, uh, all kinds of variations in the type of ways that God chose to uh, reveal himself to us, and the apocalyptic or symbolic approach is one that he definitely used uh, a fair amount, and then that the uh, Jews prior to the uh, new covenant coming at the end of the old covenant period of time, they used it quite a lot in their writings because it appealed to the heart and imagination during times of persecution. And I think we would say ourselves in reading, for example, the book of Psalms, there are certain moods or situations that we're in when certain Psalms appeal to us more than others. And that's true generally with the Bible and what we look to in times of challenge. But for the Jews, it was natural to use symbolic language. God had done it. Prophets had done it, and so uh, he chose to do that in Revelation. And of course, now, 2,000 years later, we're not used to this. It seems odd and strange to us, and some people say scary. I've had a lot of people tell me that reading my exposition of Revelation helped them a great deal because they were afraid to read the book prior to that. But once they learned it's not nearly so mysterious as they thought, then it became a book uh, that was to them exciting, which is great. So what we're trying to do is make the Bible come alive. Now, you obviously know, and you even said in, in uh, several times in the series there, that what you are presenting is different than what has become common for the Christian world. And so you claim that the modern theories about the millennium are only recent, yet didn't some early church fathers hold similar views? Uh, yes, that is true. I, I would say similar. Uh, I would use that term uh, carefully because it was not nearly as complex or sensational as what we read today. Uh, people like uh, Irenaeus and Papias or Papias uh, did teach a literal thousand year reign, uh, taking Revelation 20 literally, but uh, they didn't get nearly as far off uh, on what they were teaching as the modern guys do. 
But I, I would say this, Paul and Peter and other New Testament writers dealt with false teachers in their day when apostles were living and able to speak with inspiration and correct things and all of that. So why would we be surprised that false teaching is found in the second or the third or the fourth or the 15th or the 21st generation or uh, uh, century? So I would say that even back in 2 Thessalonians 2, I think I use this, verses 1 and 2. But he says, Paul, as he writes, quote, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. So there were false teachers that Paul was addressing that took his teachings and twisted them, which is what you get when you come up with sensational views of the Bible. You twist things that are there. First Corinthians 15 deals with that. People saying that the uh, resurrection was passed already. And so they were obviously teaching a different type of resurrection than a bodily resurrection at the end of time. And Paul corrected that one as well. But there is something about end times teaching that produces a plethora of false teaching, false ideas, uh, false prophets. That was true in the first century, and it is definitely true in the 21st. Now, let, let's get into some more specifics here. What is the Battle of Armageddon that's mentioned in Revelation 16, 16? Well, you know, we tend to want to make that some literal future battle, but uh, Armageddon comes from Armageddon, the, the Mount of Megiddo, and that is a place where many battles were fought in the Old Testament period and later, many not recorded in the Old Testament, uh, but uh, there were battles for hundreds and hundreds of years, centuries, that were fought in that place. It was just a good place to do battle, and so they often met in that uh, plain of Megiddo by the mountain there and, and had many battles. So someone familiar with Old Testament history, the Jews of the first century, for example, uh, would see that what John was writing about was simply a symbol, like so many other symbols in Revelation. It was a symbol for a great battle, a spiritual battle in this case. The battle between Rome and the church is in the background of Revelation, of course, and then in chapter 12, he goes back into a deeper background, showing that what is taking place between humans is really something generated by Satan and his forces of evil against God and his forces of righteousness. And so there is a galactic uh, spiritual battle going on, and we humans just are at the very end of that or extension of that as we have righteousness and sin conflicting in our world as well, the physical world. But at any rate, uh, that was what was going on back there. So Armageddon has become a term we use for a lot of things. In today's world of conspiracy theories, for example, the preppers or the survivalists are storing up food and gold and silver since they say money won't work anymore, guns and ammunition protect their uh, property and their food and all of that from all of the scavengers that are going to be going about when, quote, Armageddon comes. So it's a term that's used in different senses, but in the prophecy uh, setting where people are actually trying to uh, interpret Bible and Revelation, I think wrongly, but they try to make that a literal battle when it simply is another symbol in Revelation, and this one standing for the galactic spiritual battle that is taking place with God, Satan, and their forces, and we are acting it out in the physical sense uh, among humans. Can you help us out here still with the rapture? Because there's so many that teach it today. Okay, that uh, is still confusing to people. I understand that. And it is a very... Uh, amazing thing here. In the book of Revelation, you get people that are on the earth going through the challenges. 
And then you get people that are already delivered from that. They may have just died or they may have been martyred. And so they're in white robes and praising God. And they're a vast multitude that cannot be numbered, et cetera. And so I discussed that some in chapter seven with 144,000, saying that that was not a literal number, but it did represent those uh, that were on the earth. And God is promising to protect them during uh, the battles that are going to be raging with the persecution of Rome against them. But then in the same chapter, you have a great multitude that no one could number, showing that they're now delivered. And so since you have people on earth in persecution and people delivered, then what has happened is those who teach the rapture, as it's commonly taught, say that uh, First Thessalonians is just one side of this, and that is the uh, uh, side of the Christians that are the vast multitude taken up. And this explains in their uh, rather elaborate theory how those Christians got taken up or at some future point will be taken up uh, to be a part of that great multitude. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, here's the passage, beginning in verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And that theme goes on through uh, chapter 5, by the way, verse 11. But he says two different times, uh, let's encourage each other with these words. And so the background is that these early Christians, as their loved ones died, that were fellow Christians, as they died, they're thinking, wow, the Lord hasn't come yet. Do they lose their reward? And Paul is saying, no, not at all. The ones that have died will be raised, and then we will, with them all together, be called up to meet the Lord. And uh, in verse 17, the phrase they're caught up, uh, comes from the Latin raptus, which is the basis of this religious theory of the rapture. And so the only people he's talking about uh, is the uh, group that have died and the group that's still living. So dead Christians and living Christians, nothing is said at all about the non-Christians. That's something that is brought in and inserted uh, from Revelation or other passages, but it, it has nothing to do with the context of this passage in Thessalonians. He's just dealing with two kinds of people and the, being caught up. It's just a common word that is used uh, in other places, but it's a common word just saying that we'll be gathered with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. So it doesn't discuss dead people uh, saved or, I mean, uh, lost people saved or living. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting my terms messed up. It doesn't discuss non-Christians, whether living or dead. And so if you want to know about non-Christians and what happens to them, then you've got to go to a passage that deals with it. And the one that I used earlier is John 5, verses 28 to 29. He says, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. So everyone in the graves gets raised at the same time, whether saved or lost. And that's when the judgment day comes for all of us. But that's a passage that deals with uh, non-Christians and Christians together. And uh, certainly First Thessalonians has nothing to say at all about non-Christians. He's not addressing that. So you can't go to a passage that doesn't address something and force it to say something that it doesn't say. So in spite of the books and the movies left behind, they have no basis in fact and uh, biblically. And when you look at some of the earlier teachings of that by guys like Hal Lindsey, it was, I mean, there's so many errors in what this guy has taught, and certainly in that book, The Late Great Planet Earth. When you read that, I mean, it, it's got some hilarious stuff in it. It's, it's so far-fetched, 
and even some of his understanding of things like football and uh, whatever. Uh, he gives an example there that gets the uh, positions and all of that messed up. So he, he should send, spend more time. He's still alive in his 90s. He should spend more time watching football than uh, speculating with his wild speculations about the end times in my judgment. All right. All right. There you go. So you had addressed Matthew 24 in uh, one of the earlier episodes. And so I want to kind of go back to that. So Matthew 24 talks about wars and rumors of wars and, you know, famines and earthquakes. Doesn't all of this fit into our time well and, and could signify the end times are coming soon? Well, that's what a lot of people say. But if you go back and uh, in, in history, I mean, we've had those things. When, when did we not have? I'll be 80 years old my next birthday. There's never been a time since I was born during World War II. There's never been a time since we didn't have all of these things, famines and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. And yes, we're surely in that right now with the whole thing with Russia and uh, the Ukraine going on, obviously, but it's all over the world. And uh, those who study from a scientific standpoint, earthquakes. I read a little piece on Douglas Jacoby's website. And if you're not familiar with that, I certainly recommend it, Douglas ja douglasjacoby.com. Uh, but he answers a lot of questions. And if you uh, subscribe and pay for your subscription, you get a lot more. But Doug is a man that puts out a lot of material. And uh, I'm glad he does. He puts out a lot of very good material. But he does a, a little study on earthquakes and just shows that this has been going on because of the way the earth is built. You've constantly got things going on with the earth's crust shifting and moving and changing that's just been a constant since the creation. So anyway, uh, these things would fit pretty much any time in history. But the issue is that he is talking to a people in the first century, and they were signs for them. So whatever the symbolic language is, coming down through the early part of Matthew 24, he still gets to verse 34, and he says, quote, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And that goes back to the uh, question the apostles had at the beginning of the chapter. They were bragging about the temple and how beautiful it was and that it was made possible by the rich people giving. They felt like Jesus had just sort of dissed the uh, rich people, when he talked about the little widow that out gave all of them with two copper coins, but that's a good lesson all in its own. But at any rate, he told them that one stone was not going to be left on another. Matthew's account says, well, what, when is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? If you look at Mark's account and Luke's account, they just say, when will these things be and what's the sign when they're about to happen? So uh, Matthew is just using Jewish terminology, the uh, coming in judgment in the end of the age. They assume if you destroy Jerusalem and the temple, the Jewish age is basically for all practical purposes over. And it actually was. And it did signify that. And Hebrews 8 makes that plain, but that's another subject for another time. Uh, he says this generation won't pass away till these things have happened. He spoke that in about AD 30. It was fulfilled 40 years later, the time of a generation of that day. That's what it was considered. And so in AD 70, when Titus and the Roman armies came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, uh, they all did come to fulfillment. And the reason he spoke these things and said, pray that it won't be on a Sabbath day or pray that it won't be in the winter is because uh, these people were being prepared by him, the Christians were, to get out of the city when the city was surrounded. Luke's account, a Gentile writer writing to a Gentile audience, when you get to uh, his account in Luke 21, and then sort of a parallel in Luke 17, he's saying when you see Jerusalem surrounded, then understand that her desolation is near. So she was surrounded, and then for a brief time, 
uh, they the the army stopped uh, uh, being aggressive, and it gave the Christians who had been forewarned in this passage gave them time to leave, and they left, and a number of them went to a little city called Pella, and so they understood what Jesus was saying, took it to heart, and escaped the city before it was completely destroyed. So are these things, like the earthquakes and the wars and rumors of wars, et cetera, are they still happening? Yes. Uh, have they happened throughout history? Yes. Uh, the context of Matthew 24 is specific to the first century, and that is therefore the guide to how to interpret that and how to apply these symbols. And it was certainly to that generation uh, that would uh, start there from the beginning of the church period uh, through AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And Jerusalem, of course, is inhabited today. I have been there, but the temple has never been rebuilt. And so it did signify the end of the old covenant. And then the new covenant came in uh, with the day of Pentecost described in Acts 2. You even mentioned earlier that this is a, a hot topic that you're being requested to speak about. And Revelation usually is a hot topic for many, but obviously with everything that's been going on recently with COVID and uh social injustice and, and all these different things that are taking place. Could the mark of the beast that's mentioned in Revelation 13, could that be the COVID-19 vaccine? <laughs> well, I, I love that question because it points out uh, that the mark of the beast uh, described in, in Revelation 13, the mark of the beast uh, is one thing that has mystified people and caught their interest. And I dare say, if you did a little research, I haven't done it, nor do I intend to, but if you did a little research, I would imagine that you could easily come up with a list of at least a hundred different things and persons who have been identified as the mark of the beast. I've seen many of these, virtually any figure of history that's controversial in the least, has been described as the mark of the beast by some people. There's more speculation on this than almost anything, honestly. I remember when I first got into ministry years ago, we had a barber in the congregation, and uh, he, he invited me to come and, and get a free haircut, as I recall. And uh, so I did that. But he said, now, we've got this guy that comes in, and I'm going to call you when, he, when he's here. I'm going to call you so you can come down and get a haircut then. But I, I'll, I'll egg him on a bit to talk about the mark of the beast, because I think you'll get a kick out of it. So I go into this old-time barbershop back in uh, about 1972, I think it was. And so he gets this fellow in the chair and starts cutting his hair. And, of course, the guy can look out and see me, but he can't see what my friend Bill uh, was doing face with his facial expressions, which were quite hilarious. But anyway, he uh, poses the question to this guy. He said, Gordon, here's a young minister in our church, and I know that you've done a lot of study on the mark of the beast, so uh, why don't you share with Gordon uh, your idea about what that is? And so the fellow started off with it. And he had quite an elaborate explanation as to why his view of the mark of the beast was true. But my barber friend, Bill, is sitting back or standing back behind him just laughing. I mean, he, he can't, he's not laughing out loud, but he is <laughs> laughing. And so I'm sitting there listening to this wild speculation and having to keep a straight face while I'm watching Bill laugh. And it, it was hilarious. I don't even remember what it was now, but it was just one of many speculations. If you look it up, if you Google it, uh, you'll find out, for example, that uh, most of the political figures have been uh, identified as the mark of the beast. Obama, his name pops out really quickly on Google when you go and look at that. And I'm not sure why they picked him, probably not so much his color, but uh, perhaps some of the uh, birther 
theories and uh, his religious uh, affiliation, which many claim is more Muslim than Christian, et cetera. But uh, you'll find many figures, and I have no doubt that you can find uh, Trump mentioned as the mark of the beast by someone somewhere for sure, uh, probably a lot of people. But uh, political figures that are the least bit controversial, they will be described that way. But then anything that has to do with a mark, whether it's barcodes or whatever else, that has been identified as the mark of the beast. And the COVID vaccine, that also has been identified as the mark of the beast. And so if you get the shot, then you may get inserted with some kind of a chip that uh, is used to control your life, et cetera. And so, yes, uh, uh, all of these things have been identified. But Revelation 13 is written to Christians being persecuted and killed uh, for their faith. And when he uses the term 666, since numbers are used so much in Revelation and have their own meaning as a symbol, uh, if the number seven was perfection, and it was and is biblically, then six is like our number 13, it's failure. It's bad, it's superstitious, it's negative. And so to say that the beast, in this case, the, uh, the uh, emperor or the string of emperors, but particularly Domitian, who was the one who was the first big persecutor that demanded to be called Lord God Domitian during his life. Uh, he was the one most identified with the mark of the beast at the point of Revelation 13. And so all that the symbols are showing us is that he is failure upon failure upon failure. And so I think that's the best way to identify it. I have seen people try to take the uh, Greek uh, letters of their alphabet and assign some numerical uh, equivalent to it and come up with uh, something that way. And uh, I've never seen any of those that were totally uh, effective or believable. So to me, I make it simple. The simplest way is usually the best way, especially dealing with symbolism. And that is failure upon failure upon failure of the beast, of the Roman Empire, and the emperor in particular, and the false prophet or the land beast that supported him, which was religious uh, Rome that made people say in time, they had to go to a, uh, a certain place. Like we go to a certain place to get our driver's license. They went to a certain place and they had to pinch incense once a year and say, Caesar is Lord, uh, as they did that. And if they didn't, they couldn't buy and sell. The passage says they economically were discriminated against quite severely. And then in time, if they weren't willing to do that, they actually died for it. And that then ushered in a whole issue after the persecution was over because a number of Christians had said Caesar is Lord in order to save their lives. And so the early church had to wrestle with now, what do we do with the confessors? What about the ones who did say Caesar is Lord to save their lives? Can we let them back in fellowship with the church or not? And that became an issue that was a really big one as the persecution began to die down. So a lot of other things grew out of that, but the mark of the beast, no, it's not any one of the hundred or more things that people have identified as that, but it seems to be quite uh, uh, conducive to a lot of speculation. So that's the mark of the beast. Let, let's get over to the, another big one, the Antichrist. So t t tell us some more, okay, who and, and what is that all about? Okay, the Antichrist, of course, on the end time theory is the, the common one. Uh, what happens is you have the rapture when uh, all the uh, living Christians are taken up with Christ. Seven years they are with him uh, in heaven as they're taken up with him. On earth then you have the non-believers left and uh, it becomes more and more intensely evil. And then about halfway through that at the three and a half year mark, and of course, Revelation uses the number three and a half 
and the and other equivalents of it. Uh, Forty two months, uh, three and a half years, uh, uh, twelve hundred and sixty days. A time times and half a time. Another way to say three and a half. You find that uh, very. Frequently in Revelation, it was a period of instability, a period of persecution, but it was going to end. It was half the perfect seven, and so it was going to end. And that was what the three and a half was to convey, a period of instability, a period of persecution that had an ending. But at any rate, in the view of the seven-year raptured up people, on earth, it gets worse and worse. And at the three and a half year mark, you have the great tribulation and the antichrist, personal antichrist that figures uh, hugely in this great uh, battle here uh, in the last three and a half years. And so that's uh, generally how it is uh, set up and introduced. But uh, Jesus comes back, of course, at the end of the seven years to the end of the great tribulation, the three and a half year period at the end of that, ends it all, defeats all the enemies, sets up a thousand year reign in Jerusalem, restores the temple, etc. So uh, that's all a part of the theory. Now, if you get down to the Bible, uh, if you like all the theory part and get excited about all of that, you're going to really be disappointed when you get down to what the Bible says about it, sort of like the rapture. Uh, when you get down to what is actually said in the context, uh, it's very disappointing if you're looking for wild speculation to get your adrenaline flowing. Find some other way to do that. Roller coasters were always sort of my favorite, especially the ones that went upside down a lot. Uh, that one, by the way, in uh, Magic Mountain, I hadn't been there for years, but I used to go to that one in Magic Mountain. It had seven loops, I think. That was my favorite. Although once I got off it and it uh, didn't have a line and uh, I got off and went right back on and all those G-forces gave me a pretty bad headache after the second round. So I let it rest for a while. But anyway, look for some other way to get your adrenaline flowing. Uh, don't do it through uh, erroneous speculation about Revelation. But here's what the Bible says about it. Five times the word Antichrist is used. Five times. John the Apostle used them all five times, and he used them in his epistles, his little short books. And so you find him mentioning Antichrist, or one time in the plural, five times. Uh, twice in 1 John 2.18, uh, then in 1 John 2, 22, again in chapter 4, verse 3, and then finally in his second epistle, uh, verse 7. We say 2 John 1, 7, but it's only one chapter, so 2 John, verse 7. Anyway, in the 1 John verses, you find two things. One is that many antichrists had already come as John was writing this. And two, he defined those as not acknowledging Jesus or denying Jesus as the Christ. And so, of course, there are many ways to deny Jesus. We can deny Jesus by the way that we talk or live, for that matter. But at any rate, we have to go to 2 John 1, verse 7, and he gives us the exact specific of how they denied Christ. Here's the quote. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So he defines the Antichrist. They denied Christ. They were against Christ by denying him. But how did they deny him? They denied him by saying that he was not both God and man. He was not in the flesh. And so John is very specific. He talks about our hands handling him, et cetera, because uh, that was a part of the Gnostic doctrine that became much more popularized later. But it was a part of actually most religious or spiritual beliefs uh, of the time. It was very, very common that people believed that anything material was bad, and all that mattered was the spirit. 
And out of that grew, and this is in the New Testament, two different types of behavioral issues. You had those that said, well, since material is bad and, uh, and the flesh is bad, then whatever you do, it doesn't matter as long as you believe the right things. And so even if you're being immoral and doing other things, as long as you believe the right thing, it doesn't matter because the flesh is evil anyway. So just go ahead and satisfy it. And that comes up in uh, Second Peter, that comes up in Jude. Uh, that was the more, what we call the libertine view of Gnosticism. Then you had the ascetics and they said, since the flesh is bad, deny it. And so you had that, Paul wrote about that in several places. Those that just denied anything that was uh, pleasurable or uh, whatever. They forbade to eat, to get married, for, forbade to eat certain kinds of food. And Paul said, no, it's all the foods created to be enjoyed with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And so Paul uh, said that not everything that uh, is pleasing to the physical part of us is wrong, but the Gnostics differed with that on the ascetic side of it. Kind of reminds me of uh, the easiest diet I ever heard about. I've tried many, but someone said, if you don't want to count calories and carbohydrates and all that kind of stuff, here's the simplest diet available. If it tastes good, spit it out. And that would be pretty much the uh, ascetic side of the Gnostics. Anyway, the docetics, uh, usually you'll find this under the term uh, docetism, but the docetics said that Jesus could not have been in the flesh because material things are evil and he wouldn't have been in the flesh. And so the docetic doctrine says that he just seemed to be physical but he really wasn't. And so that was a, a side of Gnosticism or a certain type of Gnosticism. But that was what uh, John was dealing with was the docetic doctrine that denied that Jesus came in the flesh. And that, frankly, is the long and short of it. The Bible knows nothing of a personal antichrist or a great tribulation in the last three and a half years before Christ comes, none of that stuff. The rapture, none of that stuff. It's just not in the Bible. It's made up. And so let's get to this uh, other topic here. Will there be a restoration of the Jews in the end times? Well, that is a big question right there. Uh, I'm going to say no. Uh, off the bat, if you want to know where I'm going, I'm going to say no. But that is a much more detailed study. It takes a lot more background on this one than anything else you've asked today. We, we've got to understand uh, Jewish history. We've got to understand the place of the Jewish nation in the plan of God. And if we can grasp this one point to begin with, we can get hold of this one. During the Old Testament period, of course, God began the Jewish nation with Abraham and his offspring until finally we get uh, Jacob having 12 boys and each one of them became a tribe, etc. cetera. So uh, that's kind of how it all developed. But uh, as God called the Jewish nation out of Egypt, went into the wilderness, got through the 40-year period of basic punishment for unbelief, and then went into the promised land. At that point, they spent a year getting the tabernacle built and the laws given and became a religious nation as best they could at that time. But when God called the nation, he was calling them really in two ways at once. He was calling them as a nation, every last Jew. That was a physical election for the purpose of keeping them separate from the rest of the idolatrous world and allowing them to learn uh, a lot of religious terminology and practices that would carry over at least symbolically into the new covenant 
but it was a preparation for Jesus coming and the new covenant and the spiritual uh, relationship that we then have uh, with God through Christ. So that was the purpose of calling a nation to be separate and to develop them as best they would allow being developed to develop them for the ultimate coming of Christ and the new covenant that would be God's last way of dealing with man before the end of time. Now, the problem was most of the Jews did not have a spiritual heart. And so there were two elections going on at once. The physical nation was elected for the purpose I've just described, but then within the physical nation, there was a spiritual election of those who did learn to love God and serve him according to the law from the heart. Now, they learned to serve God outwardly because a lot of things could happen to them bad if they didn't. They learned how to do that fairly quickly, but they didn't have their heart in it. And so the book of Deuteronomy, the last book of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy is all about the heart. And loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's in Deuteronomy. That's the Shema of the Jews in chapter 6. So anyway, uh, the ones that really did develop a heart for God were a part of his spiritual election. And that group was a lot, lot smaller than the former group that encompassed the entire Jewish nation. Sometimes in uh, in the Bible, in the New Testament, that spiritual group is called simply the remnant. And those were the ones who had a heart for God. They were the ones that listened to the prophecies. And when they heard about Jesus, they did accept. And 3,000 in that uh, category got baptized on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So you've got to understand that you had the Jews as a whole, as a nation, and God was using them to bring forth the Christ ultimately and with him, the new covenant. But then you had within the group, uh, a very much smaller group, a remnant of those that actually had a heart for God. So all of the Jews uh, were never God's people spiritually, never. Uh, They were God's people in a physical sense because he was using them as a nation, but spiritually, most of them weren't right with God. They weren't saved. Uh, and Paul deals with that topic in Romans 9 through 11. I have an exposition on that as well. You'd do well to read it, I think, if you're interested in the subject. But in Romans 9 through 11, the Jews that didn't become Christians, it seemed like to them that what they were hearing from their fellow Jews that had become Christians is that God somehow had rejected Israel as a whole. And of course, a lot of them became Christians. Paul himself became a Christian. That took a lot of doing, but he did. And so in chapters 9 through 11, as I outline that in my exposition, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 29, which is almost the whole chapter, it says God has a right to make a choice. And he goes through their history and said, listen, God chose uh, Isaac, uh, not Jacob, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, he he chose, uh, to start with, he chose um, uh, not Ishmael, he he chose Isaac, and then later he chose Jacob, not Esau. So he he made choices that they didn't differ with, they didn't have a problem with that, because that was their history, and they understood that, that God has a right to make a choice. Now, we know that God's choices will always be righteous. He won't make wrong choices, he'll make only right choices but he has the right to make the choice. And that was the argument in chapter nine. Then the second part of it is beginning in verse 30 of the same chapter and going through uh, chapter 10, Israel made the wrong choice. They sought it. They sought God's favor by their works, by earning it, by keeping the law, not by a heart of faith that motivated them to keep the law. So the question is, when we obey God, are we obeying? to honor him or to exalt ourselves. And that's the real issue. Is it a work of law, something that we look at ourselves as having done and now God owes us, or do we look at it as a work of faith, something we do as we look to God for his mercy? 
uh, and uh, develop a relationship with them. So that's chapter 10, basically. Then in chapter 11, God, uh, Israel's choice is not irreversible. So even though they made the wrong choice, Paul is showing it doesn't have to be that way. I don't want it to be that way. I've got a plan uh, for it to be different from that. And so once the church started, ushering in the new covenant for Jews and Gentiles alike, national Israel was no longer the chosen nation. They are not now. They have not been since Acts chapter 2. Uh, because now those in the church are a part of the new covenant, and they are the new Israel or the spiritual Israel. For example, Philippians 3.3. 3. Paul says, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And so he's talking, of course, about uh, the, the Jews called themselves the circumcision. That was their, their mark of identity as Jews, the males. And so Paul says, no, we're the real circumcision, the spiritual circumcision. And uh, Colossians 2 talks about that circumcision. But he says, we serve God by the spirit. We boast in Christ. We put no confidence in the flesh. So whether we're Jews, Gentiles, whatever we are, our national identity is not the issue. Our confidence is, our identity is we belong to Christ. And so that's a good lesson for us today, by the way. Uh, I'm not a white Christian. Uh, Marcel, you're not a black Christian. You are a Christian who happens to be black, and I'm a Christian who happens to be white. I'm a Christian who happens to be American, but I'm not an American Christian uh, in that sense, because most who put American first have more of a, an American nationalism concept, and that's another subject, but it's related, believe me. And so if we have no confidence in the flesh, then our first identity is always Christian not race, not nationality, not anything else, but Christian. Now, Galatians 6, beginning in verse 14, Paul says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. And so he makes it so clear that Christians, uh, Jew or Gentile or anything else, uh, we are the Israel of God. We are the new Israel, the spiritual Israel. And so God used both the uh, physical Israelites in the Old Testament and the ones who were spiritual to bring forth Christ and the new covenant and the spiritual Israelites accepted Christ, and the ones who didn't became persecutors of them. And so the key passage, though, that we need to look at before I close this one out is in Romans 11. And he starts off by explaining how he has hope for Jews in the future to be saved. This is in verses 25 to 26. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel, talking about physical Israel, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, when he says in this way, kutos in Greek, it has to do with manner. In this manner, all Israel will be saved. The older versions didn't make that very clear. Uh, some of them translated, and so all Israel shall be saved. Well, that made you think, it was misleading, it made you think, and then all Israel will be saved, and so at some future point, all of the nation of Israel will be saved. Well, uh, so is an adverb of manner. It just means in this way. So what was the way that Paul was talking about that the Jews would be saved? Back up to verse 11 in the same chapter. Again, I ask, 
did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Talking about physical Israel. He says, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression meant riches for the world, then their loss means riches for the Gentiles. How much greater riches will their in full inclusion bring? And he says, I'm talking to you Gentiles in so much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. So bottom line, what he's saying, is because the Jews rejected Christ, that meant that he died for all of our sins. And as Paul and others went around preaching, they would start, if they were Jews, they would start in the synagogues, but that didn't last long, and then they would go to the Gentiles. So it was always to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. For the Jews that had a heart and knew their prophecies and would accept the truth, they became sort of the, uh, the seed of the uh, church that was going to be built in that city. And there are many things that came out of that that were very good. They had leaders in the synagogues that could become elders soon, and that explains how elders were appointed so fast in the first century. But at any rate, uh, they became sort of a, a foundation in many cities for the church. But then, because the majority of the Jews rejected what Paul and others were preaching, they went to the Gentiles. And so their transgression meant crucifixion, salvation offered. It also meant as the gospel spread that as they uh, continued to reject Christ, then the Gentiles got to hear the message quicker and all of that sort of thing. But he said, if uh, as the Gentiles become more and more in number, then it provokes the Jews to jealousy and makes them reconsider what they are missing. And so he says he's hoping that that is going to arouse them to envy and save some of them. He didn't say all of them here. He said some of them. So then that brings on the question, why did he say all Israel will be saved in verse 26? Well, in that one, I think it would be very similar to many passages that uh, are somewhat of an overstatement uh, in order to make a point. For example, in John 12, 32, what did Jesus say? If I be lifted up from the earth, uh, I will draw all men to myself, all people to myself. Uh, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, John 13. John 17, talking about unity. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. Well, he's not using all in the sense of that being literal. He's showing it as a great potential. So Paul is saying all Israel in the same sense. He just have a, has a great deal of hope in people coming to Christ, his own fellow Israelites coming to Christ when they saw the blessings that the Gentiles were receiving and therefore were provoked to envy and therefore uh, reconsidered restudied, and were open then to seeing the prophecies and all the other things that pointed so much to Christ. But Paul never envisioned anyone being saved apart from acceptance of Christ as Lord. And Jesus made clear in passages like Matthew 7, it's always going to be a narrow road with a few people on it and a broad road with most people on it. It's never been any different. It wasn't different in Jesus' day. It will not be different between now and the very end of the world. It's always going to be a matter of heart. Those that have enough heart to believe and accept Jesus as their Lord. Uh, that's the only way anybody has ever gotten saved from the day of Pentecost on in the new covenant. And no one will ever be saved without that. So do I believe there's going to be a mass conversion of the Jews before the end of time? No, not at all. I have talked to many Jews. And I find them no more receptive uh, than anyone else, and in many cases not as receptive, but I have many friends that are Jewish that are Christians. And I tell them, I'm always envious of you. I've never been at all, ever 
anti-Semitic. Even for people that say, well, the, the Jews are the ones that kill Christ. Yeah, that's true. And us Gentiles helped to do it because it was our sins that nailed him to the cross. So I've never had any uh, anti-Semitic feelings toward Jews. I, I tell the ones I know, I'm envious of you. I'm a child of Abraham by faith once. You're a child of Abraham twice, physically and spiritually, if they're Christians. So anyway, that's a longer study, but if you want to study it out, you could look at my uh, exposition of Romans. Uh, it's called Romans, the Heart Set Free, and I go into more detail there about the, uh, live, the uh, physical Jews in Romans 9 to 11. But that gives you a shot at it. That will conclude our first part of our Q&A with Gordon Ferguson. Part two will come out next week. Thank you for listening to The Deeper Dive by the OC Church of Christ. If you want to get connected to us or want to donate to the program, go to our website, occhurchofchrist.com, or reach out to us through social media at the OC Church. Join us next time as we will conclude our Q&A with Gordon Ferguson from our Revelation Revealed series. See you next time on The Deeper Dive.